Hello, my name is Nick Hopwood. I'm from the University of Technology Sydney School of Education. This is the first in a series of four videos about academic rejection. Why would I do a series of videos about that? Well, firstly, I've been rejected a lot and I've got to thinking about why I get rejected and how I could best respond. Secondly, because I see the effects that rejection has on my colleagues and doctoral students that I work with. Thirdly, because when rejection happens, it does seem like a ridiculous waste of time and it's very frustrating. But I wonder if there are other ways of thinking about rejection in scholarly publishing. And fourthly, because last year I stuck up all my rejections or summaries of them on my office door and invited people to come and have a look and tweeted about it. Uh, I called it my rejection wall. And that tweet was very popular and a lot of people looked at it and commented on it. And it's made me think there's a real need for more resources and kind of dialogue about how we deal with rejection. This first video is about why people get rejected from academic journals. What position do I have to say anything about this? Well, firstly, as an academic, I've been rejected lots of times from lots of different journals. Sometimes the papers ended up being published elsewhere or even in one case actually back in the original journal that rejected it. And other times I realised that the rejection was because the paper just really wasn't very good and I abandoned it and it's never seen the light of day. I'm also a reviewer. I do at least as many reviews as I receive as an author, uh, usually a few more, and, and sometimes I do recommend to the editors a rejection. And I'm also an editor of the journal Studies in Continuing Education. Uh, we reject, I think, more than 50% of our papers that are submitted, uh, some without even going to review, many without even going to review. Um, but I've also guest edited some special issues. So I kind of see rejection from it happening to me as a reviewer and as an editor. So the most important thing to remember when you're asking why do people get rejected from academic journals is because there are human beings involved. Simple. This means we should not always expect decisions to be accurate, fair or predictable. It also means that sometimes the decision by the author that something is ready for publication in a particular journal or close to being ready for publication is wrong too. So I think it's helpful to think about scholarly and human reasons for rejection. So what are the scholarly reasons for rejection? Firstly, you've written a great paper, but you sent it to the wrong journal. Now that happens a lot of the time, and uh, we do many desk rejects from the journal I edit because they're not suitable for our journal, even though they might be really excellent research. So you can avoid that by you know, doing your homework on the aims and scope of the journal, perhaps even checking out who the editors are. If editorial boards of journals have changed, that might mean they have a new vision for the journal or something like that. Also, emailing editors with an abstract or an outline of the paper might avoid that kind of rejection if they give you some guidance and say, I don't really think this fits. The best question to ask is, are there papers that look and feel like mine in the back catalogue from this journal? And if the answer is no, there's a chance that you're doing something that the editors are probably not very familiar with or the reviewers for that journal won't necessarily see as fitting in that journal. Second scholarly reason, you've crammed more than one paper into a single manuscript. I can't remember how many times I've, as a reviewer, um, recommended that a paper be rejected or re at least rejected and resubmitted um, because it's trying to say too much. Um, too many arguments, too much data, not enough time for the author to explain things, not enough time to adequately deal with the discussions or the conclusions or relevant literature. Um, good papers make kind of one key contribution and make it really cleanly. So a lot of rejections because there's too much in a paper. The third reason for a scholarly rejection, or the third scholarly reason for rejection, um, is kind of the opposite, is that you undermine the fundamentals of journal publishing by not offering unique content. The second reason was there's too much in a paper. This one is essentially there's too little. You might write 7,000 words, but it counts as nothing if none of that offers unique content. What I mean by unique content is saying something nobody has said before, offering data that nobody has presented before, Findings that are new, interpretations that go counter to a trend or something like that. There has to be something 
that would mean somebody would read your paper rather than or as well as the existing work. If all you do is replicate existing work, there's nothing new, there's no new unique content in that journal paper, and that's wasted pages and wasted time from a publisher's point of view. So too much in a paper can be rejected, not enough in terms of original content or argumentation, another rejection. You might also be rejected because you fail to address the readership of the journal. I've been rejected several times for this reason. You might uh, not re engage with an international audience. I've been rejected because when I was working in the UK, I wrote about PhDs and I wrote about them as if every country did PhDs in the way that England did. And of course that's not true and it was a complete oversight of mine, a sloppy oversight I would admit, um, not to include that international context and help people understand the UK policy framework around PhDs. There might be concepts that will be unfamiliar to readers or um, ideas that are strange or being approached in a new way. A really important thing is that sometimes papers are not framed about what readers of the education of the journal care about. Now, I've just suggested that we reject one from my journal because it's on a very interesting topic that could be made relevant to our journal. But in the first few pages and in the last few pages, I couldn't see anything that would make it relevant to what I know the readers of my journal care about, which in this case is continuing education. Now, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but at the moment, that paper is not a good fit for our journal. I've been rejected and I've given, I've suggested rejections because the work is also unfinished or comes across as half-baked. Um, particularly halfway through or work in progress. Um, it's kind of, I can see why I've done it in the past and why other people might do it. It feels like you're being honest to say this is net unfinished work or this is part of a larger project. But actually a journal paper needs to stand on its own and make a contribution. And if it feels like, well, if new data comes out, the findings might change or this is half cooked, reject. Sixth reason for scholarly rejection or scholarly reason for rejection is that your arguments and conclusions aren't supported by the data and methods. Um, and sometimes that could be a major revision, but often people think, look, if you're making these wild claims um, and your data don't support it, then they start to question, firstly, your academic integrity, your research skills, but also there's no real sense of whether if you come back with a revision, there'll actually be a contribution to knowledge there or not, depending on what your data would permit. And that's quite a big risk for an editor to send it back out to reviews again and invite a resubmission. <coughs> So um, often something like that, where the what's claimed as a contribution seems dubious, I'd be inclined to um, reject. So those are six scholarly reasons why you might be rejected. What about the human reasons? Remembering that just because there are human beings involved means sometimes you get rejected. Now there is an interaction between your text and the person reading it as a reviewer and the editor as well. And sometimes you get rejected just because you get the wrong reviewer. Now, I could look up at my journal system now and for some papers, I contact five reviewers and three of them say yes. And that's quite a good outcome in my experience. One of them I got down, I think, to 18 or 19 different reviewers that I would contacted before I got three to say yes, they would review a paper. The longer you go, the further down that list you go, the further from the exact match between the paper and the reviewer, you get. It might be a reviewer who doesn't really know the theory or isn't very familiar with the context or the methods. So you might just not get a reviewer who's really into your field and that can, can cause rejection. Bear in mind that the abstract that you put in, the keywords that you use and the people you cite in your bibliography or your reference list have very big influence over who editors choose as reviewers. And so you can get the wrong reviewer because you send out the wrong signals about who should be reviewing this paper. Now, you can also, um, in some systems, suggest reviewers, but editors will also look for these cues. What, who are you citing? Who is recently published in this area that's in your reference list? We do often have algorithms in the online systems which suggest reviewers, though in my experience there, they're not often very sensible. So you might get rejected because you just get the wrong reviewer. You might get a really well-matched reviewer having a bad day. I have bad days as an academic. There are days when I wake up in a good mood and finish in a terrible mood. I get really grumpy. Something terrible happens. Imagine the same reviewer reading a paper Friday afternoon. They've had a really crappy week. Students have been complaining. They've got a big pile of marking to do over the weekend. 
And they just hear that their grant proposal that they took six months working on has been rejected. And now they're trying to sort of get uh, they've been sat in traffic all the way home and they're now before they even get to start their weekend they've got to review your paper because the editor is hassling them the chances are they're going to be less favorable less tolerant of like problems or issues than if they read it on a day when they're having a really good day they've just been accepted in a journal or they've just found out they've got a research grant or they're less pressured in their work so sometimes you just get a human being having a bad day and that often gets taken out on you, the author. I've seen so many people say that academics vet their anger or their frustrations, not on their colleagues or their managers in person, but when they're invisible, when they can put that cloak of invisibility on as a peer reviewer. You might also get rejected for human reasons because you upset or annoy the reviewer in the first few seconds of their interaction with your text. And recovery is really hard from there. One of my best rejections, the ones that I've received, uh, that I really kind of now enjoy reading back because I realise how many things I got wrong and it's really good learning for me. Um, I really, really irritated the reviewer. I started off, it was this PhD one, I started off by not mentioning that, um, that the rest of the world did PhDs and they might do it differently from the UK. Um, and then I didn't cite this person's work and she thought I didn't know what I was talking about. And after that, then I didn't use the theories that she wanted and everything else was just grumpy 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 she fell out with me in the first few paragraphs the next section on the late review confirmed her idea that I didn't know what I was talking about after which she was very very negative and ill disposed towards what I had to say so in the end her final point was something about grammar and split infinitives had I set off on a different footing I think I could have had still some critical points raised but quite a different tone of response from that reviewer other ways to annoy reviewers are to missell the paper through the abstract. As a reviewer, I decide whether to review or not based on the abstract and what the editor tells me. Now, if I think, oh yeah, that seems reasonable or that seems something like I feel comfortable reviewing or interesting or new, and I'm gonna give up some free time instead of doing what I'd like to do, you know, being outside, free diving, whatever it is, I'm now sat with my computer looking at your work. Imagine how frustrating it is when the paper I eventually download as a PDF isn't what I thought it was gonna be. And now I've said yes to the editor and I can't really unsay yes. And so I'm stuck reviewing this crappy paper that I don't really find interesting or it doesn't deliver what it promised. It's a really good way for me to fall out with you as an author and for me to get grumpy and give you a rejection. If you miss key literature, I mentioned this before, um, but a lot of times reviewers will look to see if their name's in the bibliography. And if it's not, you might well find them suggesting that you read their work. But also it's about the kind of doyens of the field. Um, you have to sort of bow down in front of key people and missing out some people that are regarded generally as key in the field or senior or authorities on a particular topic can lead people to doubt your knowledge of the field and your therefore your authority to say something new if you're missing out those key literature. So I've learned from experience that even if something isn't directly relevant, based on my understanding of this like the key things in the field, it's a really good idea to cite some of the main texts that I think reviewers would expect to see, so that they think I know what I'm talking about. You can give a really alienating introduction, which can lead a reviewer to fall out with you. So only speaking from one part of the world, or speaking as if only one country matters, or if you're offering something new to a journal, you've really got to start with what the journal already cares about. If you go headlong into what you're interested in, journal reviewers might be like, nah, this is not for us, and fall out with you quite quickly. Another human reason for a rejection is that the reviewer acts unprofessionally or holds closed views about research or the nature of the journal. So it could be that somebody thinks your sample, if it's a qualitative research, is too small, or that they don't think postmodernism fits this journal. And it may be that the aims and scopes say yes, but you get a reviewer who has quite a narrow version of the journal. And it's then up to the editors really to mediate those things. But a, that can kind of prime them the wrong way. And you can get a strong rejection, which may end up being confirmed by the editor. So it's, I'm saying some reviewers do police boundaries around what they think is acceptable research or rigorous research or appropriate for a journal. And whether those boundaries are correct or not, that can lead to rejections. Another thing is reviewers might miss aspects that are in your paper. She or he is probably a very busy person, more than likely not being paid to do your review, not having this as part of their academic workload or stint or whatever you might call it. 
Um, and they may not read every word. They may be scanning some paragraphs. They may be reading it when they're really tired or their focus might have gone. Um, it's not usually our favourite thing to do in the day is read somebody else's journal article and then have to write a review about it, particularly if it's a tricky review to write because there's a lot that needs working on. So things like your contribution or how you do your analysis or the gap in literature that you're addressing or the argument you're making, they have to be kind of in like rhetorical flashing lights. Um, if, they're, if they're there, but they're not seen by the reviewer, they might as well not be there. And I've seen plenty of papers get rejected where they said, I can't see the contribution to knowledge here. And the authors say, well, there is one, look, it's here. And you're like, well, it was missed. And if it's missed, it might as well not be there. So there you go. There's a little summary of why I think people get rejected from academic journals. I've been rejected for most of these reasons, if not all of them. I've also, as an editor and reviewer, seen these reasons for rejection. If you can think of others or if you've had experience of these, please do add it in the comments below. I look forward to hearing from you. Bye bye.